I'd like to introduce Russ Cohen, um, unparalleled and wonderful resource um, and font of knowledge on all things um, plant in the Northeast. And I'm so, so, so thrilled that he's been able to join us tonight. Um, and I want to invite you to come to our next um, mm -hmm. gathering on January uh, 19th at 6 p.m. Yeah. and hear Russ. I'll stop my share there and you can take it over. Take it away, Russ. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, it's kind of funny to be doing a talk on this subject now when I've sort of left all this in the rear view mirror and now I'm, you know, getting ready as I'm sure a lot of you are to, you know, get your snowshoes and cross country skis out and enjoy what's about to slam into us uh, later this week, uh, which is wonderful. So, um, so I think in the uh, advertisement for this program, it mentioned that um, I used to come out to Berkshire County a lot when I was working for the Mass Fish and Game Department, and I uh, focused on the Housatonic and Hoosick Rivers. And, um, and you know, during the growing season, I'd be out there with my foraging basket, just connecting to the outdoors through my taste buds, uh, which is really fun. But, you know, when I would have a business out there during this time of year, I'd have my skis in the car and be looking forward to getting out to places like Kennedy Park and some wonderful cross-country ski trail networks that you have out there. So um, I'm envious that I'm not out there and not going to be able to enjoy those trails with you in the next couple of days. But in the meantime, so this is for future reference because with very few exceptions, uh, in the middle of the winter with frozen ground, there's not a lot of foraging opportunities. So this is stuff to file away and think about uh, for the future. And um, in, as I think uh, in the, in the uh, uh, information uh, uh, advertising this program, it said there's over 80 species of edible wild plants in Berkshire County, which is true. And some of those are native species and there's some great, wonderful native species uh, uh, to nibble on out there. Um, but the thing about native species are is they often have important uh, ecological roles too. Uh, like uh, animals rely upon native species uh, for all of some portion of their life cycles. So yes, they're uh, uh, yummy native species, but uh, I encourage people to uh, apply a lot of forbearance and restraint when you're gathering uh, native uh, uh, species from the wild, just to make sure that you don't upset the ecological balance in any way. And so, uh, uh, so it's something to that you have to apply some, you know, good concern about if you're responsible environmentalist. I'm sure everybody on this uh, Zoom program, being part of a green drinks program, would fall into that category. So. So instead, I decided to focus on the plants that you can relax more about when you gather them, because these are plants that aren't native to the Berkshires. Uh, they can be very common, sometimes exceedingly common, and some of them are very tasty, and I'll get into the delicious details in just a second. So uh, yes, yeah, so you can be much more relaxed about these. And uh, let me just go to the first slide and see if that goes through. Okay, you seeing that okay, Elizabeth? Looks good, Russ. All right, good. So, uh, so among the non-native plants are weeds and invasive species, and a weed is like a dandelion or a chicory plant or a burdock plant, so I'm going to get to all those in my talk. Those are plants that pretty much grow where people are, so you're not likely to see those pushing into natural areas, pristine ecosystems and stuff like that. That's where the invasive species can also go, so you will see them in places where, you know, like uh, edges of roadsides and stuff, but the invasive species can do more harm than that is they go into our natural habitats. And the main bad thing that invasive species do is they usurp the habitat from the native species, they take it away from them. So ecologically, they're very bad news. And because of that, so here's a, an image of a booklet that uh, got put out about a dozen years ago that's intended to educate people about invasive species. And this booklet covers 66 what are considered to be the most ecologically deleterious non-native plants that grow in Massachusetts. So, so so as I said, these plants are very ecologically disruptive, but the silver lining to the invasive cloud for foragers is that out of the 66 species covered in this book, at least 20 of them are edible. And, um, and as far as most ecologists are concerned, they'd be thrilled if we all picked and ate as many of these as we possibly could. So uh, it's a guilt-free foraging opportunity. You don't have to worry about, oh, you know, am I hurting the ecology by gathering these plants? If anything, you might be helping the ecology, although uh, I would be first to say, I don't think 
foraging is an effective control method for invasive species, but it certainly uh, isn't harmful, especially if you're careful not to spread the seeds around when you're gathering invasive species, but that is something that is easily avoidable. So, so here's uh, a bunch of invasive species. I think I'm gonna talk about, maybe not wineberry, but I'm gonna talk about the other ones in my talk, at least the ones that are spring and summer, because that's what the focus is of this uh, program is to talk about uh, when spring comes, what are the edible uh, uh, non-native plants and invasive species we're gonna encounter. So before I get to that, I want to give you one other piece of advice is, okay, let's say it's the spring and you want to start going foraging. Where should you go? I'm going to give you one generic piece of advice, and that is to think about organic farms for foraging. And I don't mean to deter you in any way from patronizing the organic farm stands, getting a CSA share if that'll work for you, because as many yummy weeds and invasive species there are, there aren't enough to make a significant dent in our food supply. So we really need to be growing our food and organic is a great way to do that. But in addition to that, organic farms make great foraging opportunities. So why is that? Well, reason number one is the obvious one. They're not slathering everything with chemicals. Reason number two is that the way they manage weeds at organic farms is they're not weeding every square inch of the farm every single day. They do it strategically. So they weed where they need to and they don't weed where they don't. And so if you time your visit right to an organic farm, you can find huge amount of weeds, uh, enough to feed whole armies. So looking forward to the days when we can have big dinner parties again, and you need lots of raw material, you can go to organic farm and get all you need that way. Then the third reason is the wonderful stuff that's in the living organic soil that makes the organically grown fruits and vegetables so healthy to eat. All the good stuff is getting into the weeds too. So the weeds you harvest at organic farms are going to have, um, they're gonna be bigger and tastier and more nutritious and just basically better than, let's say, weed growing in a crack in the sidewalk. And then the last reason is the edges of organic farms often have good edge habitats where there's fruit trees, nut trees, berry bushes, stuff like that. So my advice is form a symbiotic relationship with your local organic farmer because they have the weeds, you want the weeds, so potentially it's this great partnership. So don't uh, just go to an organic farm and start foraging, though. You need to talk to the managers, talk to the staff there, make sure uh, they're okay with it. And, uh, and actually, that's advice I would give you on any foraging that you do. If it's possible at all, and you can find the owner of a property, the manager of a property, and talk to them and just make sure they're okay with it, then you can really forage in a joyful uh, way. And you don't have to be looking over your shoulder saying, is somebody going to get on my case for doing this? So, so that's my advice. All right, so now I've told you where to go. Now I'm going to tell you what to look for. Okay, so here is the first species I typically forage for. And in Eastern Mass, I can start gathering this the first week of April. I'd probably tack a week or maybe two weeks onto that for Berkshire County. So this is a uh, plant that some of you may know. It's stinging nettle. And um, it's a, a, an herbaceous perennial, which means it will recur in the same spot year after year after year. And where you're most likely to find this plant is on the edge of a current or former farm where there are or were livestock because the stinging nettle likes a nice, rich, uh, you know, composty, uh, you know, getting a little bit of animal uh, manure in there type soil. That's where it's going to thrive. And um, all right, so let's turn the clock ahead. We're pretending it's, you know, in April and we're looking for the stinging nettle. So how would you harvest this plant? So what I will do is just gather the top cluster of leaves like this right here or this right here. So I know how to pinch these tops off without getting stung. Uh, but if you're a novice at this, you might wanna bring a pair of scissors with you to just cut the tops off. And let me say, in case you don't know, that um, unlike poison ivy, where you don't find out until a day or two later you got into it, you get stung by stinging nettle, you know right away. But on the good side, the sting rarely lasts more than an hour and there is an antidote to this thing. I'm going to teach you that in, in just a little while. All right, so take the tops off the plants. And then the next stage is to uh, throw them in some kind of a bowl of water and smush them around just to wash them off. And then I will take some tongs, so I'm still avoiding touching them if I can. And I'm just flinging the nettle tops into a cooking pot. And then I'm steaming the nettle greens in more or less the water that's still clinging to them from the washing process. So you steam them for about five minutes and they will shrink quite a lot. And 
this steaming process completely disarms the plant. So it actually turns the chemical that causes the sting in the raw vegetable into a protein. So these plants are now 7% protein, which is a pretty high number for a leafy green vegetable. Plus stinging nettles have all kinds of other vitamins in them, minerals in them like calcium. It's the closest thing I know of to a vitamin pill in the plant world. So it's a very, very nutritious plant to eat. So after you've steamed the nettle greens, you can eat them just plain or you can incorporate them into different dishes. I think their flavor is sort of like split peas. Okay, so cream of stingy nettle soup. This is a recipe in my book. It's very easy to make. It's just a pureed soup with the sauteed potatoes and onions, and then you add the half and half at the end. It's really good. And then these stingy nettle balls, this recipe is on my webpage. And this is basically a retro recipe for spinach balls from the 1950s where you used Pepperidge Farm stuffing mix to hold these balls together. And it's very easy to make. And you just substitute the steamed nettle greens for the spinach in that recipe. It works great. All right, so here's a look-alike to stinging nettle. It's actually an unrelated plant at all. It will grow in the same habitat as I'm about to show you. And I have seen this plant growing wild in Berkshire County. Well, what is it? So one of the downsides of doing this program virtually is it's hard to you know, ask a question to an audience like this. So I'm gonna just tell you in just a second about what it is. But some of you that are astute observers will see that this stem has four equal sides to it and that the leaves are coming off opposite from each other in the stem. That's the characteristic structure of plants from the mint family. And so probably most of you knew this plant was in the mint family. And some of you probably knew it is catnip. And catnip does grow wild in Berkshire County. I've seen it there. Catnip has the opposite effect on cats than it has on people. It's a sedative, it's a tranquilizer. So people will drink catnip tea to relax after a stressful day. And you can use the leaves fresh or dried either way. So here's an example of where catnip and stinging nettle are growing right next to each other. So I didn't take this photo in the Berkshires, but this could happen in the Berkshires too. So in the foreground, you have your catnip in the back is the stinging nettle. So you can see how similar they look like, but uh, stinging nettle will have the irritating little hairs on its stems. Catnip doesn't have those. And catnip has that very uh, uh, clearly square if you cut it in cross section stem. Uh, but do uh, look for them in similar kind of farmy type habitats. All right, so here is the antidote to the sting and stinging nettle. It's also an edible plant. This is a species called curled or curly dock. And it's a spring and a late summer into the fall wild edible. So uh, first let me explain how you use it as an antidote to the stinging, stinging nettle. So uh, the way to recognize the curled dock is you see the leaves have these undulating leaf margins like that, wavy leaf margins. And in the center of the plant are the leaves that are just merging that are uh, just beginning to unroll. Those are the mildest, tastiest leaves in the curled dock plant. So if you're gonna eat this plant, that's when you wanna eat. Just, just use it as a antidote to the sting. Now you take any leaf, scrunch it up, extract the juice from it and apply that juice in the place where you were stung and it will help make the, make the sting get away. So to eat this plant, you just gather up the young leaves. And what I will do is just, because this plant is a close cousin of the French sorrel, so you can make a sorrel soup from it, except you use the, the curl dock leaves instead. So the curl dock leaves have a slight bitterness to them. So what I will do with the leaves I gather is I will blanch them. I will drop them into boiling water and cook them for just 20 seconds. And that will take the bitterness away. And then you can use those leaves in uh, any dish, for example, one dish, the, the steam sting nettle greens is very good and is a wild green spanakopita, the Greek spinach pie with the filo dough and the feta cheese. You can also use this, the blanched dock leaves as a filling for the spanakopita. It's very good that way. So this plant will uh, get bitter as the spring comes on into the summer. And then uh, this plant produces a flower stalk with these reddish brown, brown flowers and the leaves disappear. And it looks like the whole plant has died, but it's just gone dormant. And then in the fall, it's pretty typical for these taproots, these yellow taproots. It's produced another uh, crop of young leaves again. And those dock leaves, which I've seen like at the end of September, beginning of uh, October, I find that the, the second crop of the dock leaves are at least as good as the spring crop. And I should also say that stinging nettle sometimes is a fall crop too. After the plants bloom and die back in the heat of the summer, sometimes you'll see some young nettle plants too. Uh, I typically harvest all the nettle plants I want in the spring and whatever I don't eat right away, I'll just uh, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, scheme the way I showed you. And then I'll just freeze the scheme that all greens and just pull them out of my freezer when I want to use them later. All right. So this species is at or near the top of the botanical blacklist. The ecologists really, really hate this species. It's called Japanese knotweed. It is a delicious uh, plant, as I will talk to you about in just a second. So, so this is another herbaceous perennial. So what happens is that at the end of the growing season, all the green living stuff dies back. And all you see are these reddish brown stalks that look like bamboo. This plant actually isn't related to bamboo at all. It's in a completely different branch of the plant family. This plant's related to rhubarb and it tastes like rhubarb as I'll get to in just a second. So in the spring, in mid to late April, early May, you wanna look for the spots uh, along the rivers, uh, for example, or the rural roadsides where you see a whole bunch of these reddish brown uh, bamboo-like stalks. And in the middle of those stalks, you'll see these new shoots coming up that look like this. So this is the wild asparagus stage of the stinging nettle. And you can just cut this off at ground level or snap it off and just take this entire shoot and steam it for a few minutes and heat it hot or cold like asparagus. So that's one way to eat the plant. My favorite stage is what I call the wild rhubarb stage where I let the stalks get a little taller, like a foot and a half, two feet tall. I'll cut them at ground level. And then I'll peel the very outer layer off because the very outer layer, the skin of a uh, knotweed stalk is stringy. So there's nothing poisonous about it. It can just get caught in your teeth if you bake with it. So I just trim that off. But as you can see, the knotweed stalks are hollow. So you don't want to trim these uh, uh, shoots too deeply or all you have left is the hole. You just want to get that very outer left layer off. And then you'll have this crisp green tube, which is tart and juicy, kind of like a Granny Smith apple. So uh, you can eat it on the spot, uh, raw, if you want, or you can chop it up and then use the peeled, chopped uh, uh, knotweed pieces uh, as a substitute for rhubarb in just about any recipe calling for rhubarb. So for example, here is my strawberry knotweed pie. The recipe is in my book. I love to make these pies. And virtually everybody I serve these pies to say, this is even better than strawberry rhubarb pie, which is great to know. So. Um, so the recipe for this is in my book. And there's an example of a shoe that you would use as the raw material for this pie. All right, so you might be looking at this pie though and say, oh, I'm a little intimidated by pie crusts and that latticework top. I don't know if I can pull that off. So I'm gonna show you a way to use the peeled, chopped up knotweed pieces that requires no cooking skill whatsoever. And as you can just take those little hollow stem pieces and fill them with like uh, flavored cream cheese or a salmon mousse, something like that. And you have these tart little edible containers that make these very fun uh, little appetizers and you feed those to people and they'll love them and you do not need know, to know how to cook to do those. All right, so here's another invasive species. This is garlic mustard. Uh, this is all over the Berkshires, unfortunately. Uh, I can't say I love to eat this one as much of the knotweed, but it is edible. Uh, the problem is that the plant can be rather pungent, which means it brings a lot of bitterness along with a garlic flavor. So uh, mostly you want to boil it for several minutes and then pour off the water just to tone down the bitterness and the flavor, make it more palatable. So this is one stage where you can harvest it when you can just gather the top cluster of flowers with little buds on there. So here's another photo of it right here. So you could just pick this entire cluster off and boil it for several minutes and then just eat the entire thing and it will taste like a garlic broccoli. Another stage, which uh, might even be better to harvest is these stems on the second year plant. So garlic mustard is a, is a biennial. So it germinates the first year, winter's over as a rosette. And then the second year sends up these uh, flower stalks. So before the flowers bloom, even before they really begin to bud on the top is when you wanna harvest these very tender, supple stems. And those you can even eat raw and the flavor is relatively mild. So they're not that bitter at all. Or you can chop them up and use them in a stir fry. So that is garlic mustard. All right, so this species is a really common weed in farms, including organic farms that is called wintercress. So when it blooms, these flowers uh, are bright yellow. And so you would see an entire farm field turn yellow with plants that aren't dandelions because the plants are like a foot or a foot and a half tall, that would be the wintercress. And that's actually too late to harvest the plant. You want to harvest it before the flowers come out when you're looking at these flower buds. So these flower buds 
look like, like broccoli rob and you prepare them like broccoli rob and they taste like broccoli rob so they're quite good so once again this plant is called wintercress all right so if this were a live audience i'd be saying what is this plant and often i get the response oh that is phlox that is incorrect this is actually a invasive species called dane's rocket and once i tell you how to tell it apart from phlox it's very easy all phlox family flowers have five petals these dame's rocket flowers have four petals so this is actually uh another mustard relative because uh almost all plants in the mustard family have four petals in the shape of a cross that's why it's called cruciferi or cruciferous vegetables so there are several parts on dame's rocket you can eat but i tend to just like the flowers because they have a wonderful flavor it's fun to eat flowers uh, it's kind of a sweet, garlicky, radishy flavor. And you see how this plant has white flowers and purpley flowers? That is almost always how you see it in the wild, the white and the purple flowers together. So it's a very plant to, easy plant to uh, learn that way, to see at a distance. And although uh, the white flowers and the purple flowers taste the same, I tend to just use the purpley flowers because purple is a funner color than white. And these are great for just eating just plain, adding to a salad, just decorating other food on a plate. And once again, it's an invasive species, so it's a guilt-free foraging opportunity. All right, so you've got some decent mountains in the Berkshires, nothing quite this big. That's actually the presidential range in Mount Washington in the background. But the point of the photo is to talk to you about dandelions. Dandelions are probably responsible for turning more people off of eating wild plants than anything else. And here is why, well, here's the typical story is it's the spring and you look out in your backyard, you see all these blooming dandelion flowers and say to yourself, I heard dandelions are edible, I should try them. So you go out to your yard, pick a few leaves, you bring them indoors, you put a little oil and vinegar on them, you take a bite, it's incredibly bitter and you spit it out and you say, yuck, I'm never going to eat a wild plant again, which is a real shame because dandelions are great if you eat the right part at the right time. So what is that and when is that? Well, in my opinion, when you start seeing whole fields turning yellow with dandelion flowers, it's really too late to be eating dandelions. You want to get them before the flowers bloom, and it's actually the unbloomed flowers, the flower buds, which I consider to be the tastiest part of the dandelion plant. In fact, I consider them to be among my tastiest vegetables, period, wild or cultivated. The flavor is like a cross between corn, spinach, Brussels sprouts, and artichokes. They're really good. And although each individual dandelion bud is admittedly small, so these are only about a quarter inch in diameter, if, as, if you follow my advice, go to an organic farm, and I have found these you know, very large uh, rampant dandelion plants in the edges of organic farms where I've been able to gather 200 buds per plant. Yes, it takes a little while to pick the buds off the plant, but if you're finding plants loaded with buds like that, uh, you can get all you need to feed yourself, you know, your family, whoever you're having over for supper, whatever. All right, so once you pick those buds, uh, all I do is wash them. So get a bucket of water out, dump the dandelion buds in just to stir them around and get off any dirt, sand, grit, whatever. Then get a pot of water boiling on the stove, drop the dandelion buds in there and cook them for 60 seconds. That's it. That's all they need. And then you can incorporate them into soups or omelets or casseroles, but before you do anything with them, before you even put any salt or butter on them, try them just plain. I think you'll be amazed at how tasty they are. And if you want to eat dandelion leaves, uh, my advice is to gather them at the same time. In fact, when I'm picking the tender buds off the plants, if I see any tender leaves on there, I just gather them too and prepare them the same way. All right, so here is chickweed. So uh, if snow wasn't imminent, I would say, oh, you can go out and look for some chickweed because this is a species that is available in the fall too, uh, or even in the winter during, uh, you know, if we get like a week of thaw when there's no snow in the ground and the ground isn't frozen, it's possible you could find some chickweed even then. But mainly I'm looking for it in the spring or in the fall. And I use it as the sprout substitute in a sandwich or lettuce substitute in a salad. Uh, it's very good. All right, daisies are edible. Now, uh, the whole plants are edible, including the flowers, but I consider the tastiest part of the daisy to be the daisy leaves before the flowers come out. So, uh, so you need to be able to recognize the plant without these white flowers on there. So what does the plant look like then? Well, I apologize, this photo is a little out of focus, but you see here is a daisy flower bud. You see it's got a flat top to it. And you see how it's got markings that kind of look like the spokes of a bicycle wheel. 
So look for that and then look for leaves that look like this. And, um, and this is the right stage to harvest the daisy leaves or the buds, any tender part of the plant. And I think the flavor is so nice. Uh, I've never cooked this plant. I've just used it raw in salads. It can be really tasty, really excellent ingredient in salads. All right, so lamb's quarter is really, really common. Uh, farm weed, garden weed. And um, the time to look for it when you're typically going to find this stage is uh, in early June in Berkshire County. Although um, this is an opportunistic plant. So anytime there's harvesting activities going on or organic farms and they pulled some plants out of the soil, the lamb's quarter seeds will germinate and they will try to grow up until, you know, the hard frost. So you, you can get multiple opportunities to harvest this one. And the whitish dust that you see in the center of each plant, that's not like uh, from a roadside or anything. That's a natural mealiness the plant produces on its own. It's actually a way to identify the plant. So this is, in fact, a wild cousin of spinach. You can use it exactly like spinach. So you can eat it raw. You can eat it cooked. You do not have to boil it. You can just steam it. Uh, the lamb's quarters is also another really excellent substitute for spinach in the Spanakopita. Uh, so I encourage you to, to, to try it that way. You do not have to boil, as I said. You just throw it in the skillet with the onions and the other ingredients that are going in the filling for the Spanakopita. All right, so here is sheep sorrel. So in, in the Berkshires, you're very lucky because you've got a lot of uh, less acidic soil with some interesting plants on it, your limestone-based soil. But in the spots where you have your more acidic soil, here you might find this plant from Europe. So this is a, a, a weed from Europe. Sheep sorrel, your Berkshires used to be famous for all the sheep, so not surprising at all that there's sheep sorrel in the Berkshires. And uh, this is an even closer cousin to the French garden sorrel than the cold aquas I showed you before. So this leaf right here with the two little teeth at the bottom, so this can be used exactly like the French garden sorrel. So sorrel sauce, sorrel soup, and salad, stuff like that. All right, so this is a spring uh, foraging opportunity. There really isn't a, a summer or fall time to get it when it's uh, good. This one, though, this is a completely unrelated plant with the same flavor called wood sorrel or sour grass. And, um, and this is not clover, by the way. Some of you may have thought it was clover. Uh, I mean, one look at these flowers, you can tell that it's not clover. And also, if you look carefully at the wood sorrel leaflets, you'll see that they are distinctively heart-shaped. So clover leaflets are much more oval shaped. Now clover leaves are technically edible by people, but you really need multiple stomachs to digest them properly. So I don't usually teach that one. And this one uh, has a nice sour flavor like the sheep sorrel. So you can use it raw, you can cook with it, and you could use the flowers too. These little guys right here, these are the immature seed capsules and they're tart and juicy, you can eat them too. All right, so the chemical responsible for the sour flavor in the wood sorrel and the sheep sorrel is a chemical called oxalic acid, which uh, might not be to eat in huge amounts. Like if you wait a tremendous salvo full of just this plant or just the sheep sorrel, uh, that much could inhibit your body's ability to uptake calcium and it could irritate your stomach lining, but there's no reason to be unduly concerned about the chemical because it's present in a lot of conventional vegetables like beets and spinach and rhubarb. So as long as you're eating in moderation, it's perfectly fine. All right, so here is plantain. This is an edible and a medicinal species. So this shot is uh, illustrates both. So right here are the tender young leaves. So this is the edible part. You can eat these raw, you can eat these cooked. You can steam them, you can boil them, uh, you can puree the leaves and make sort of a, a, a split pea, pea type soup uh, with them. So that's the edible part, uh, which is not available in the summer or the fall. It's a springtime edible. So, but the medicinal uses of the plant are available. Uh, one is available anytime you see the plant, and the other one is available when the seeds are ripe. So this is what's going to be the flower stalk that will eventually turn into the seed pod. So these seed pods, when they're ripe, get to be about 10 inches long. They're about the same thickness as a pencil. And they'll be at the at the top will be a bunch of um, uh, greenish brown seeds, and so this species right here I should mention this is Plantago major. So this is a species from Europe, and these leaves can be just about as big as a human footprint, uh, and that is actually an explanation for the name white men's or Englishman's footprint because. This is not a plant that was native to uh, New England, and it's a plant that got here after the uh, explorers and colonists came here. So that's why the indigenous peoples of this region called it the white men's or the Englishman's, 
Englishman's footprint because the only place they saw this plant growing are places where the white men have been attracted to seeds in. But uh, Native Americans quickly discovered the utility of this plant and they used it too, uh, as long as the colonists. So uh, both the edible and medicinal uses. All right, so let me finish and tell you the medicinal use is when these uh, greenish brown seeds are ripen the plant in the late summer into the fall, those seeds are uh, a close relative of another plant in the same genus called Plantago cilium, which is the source of cilium husks, which is the active ingredient of Metamucil and several other commercial laxatives. So you can use the ripe wild plantain seeds the same way. I'm not exactly sure what the dosage is, but I'm going to guess that a teaspoonful of the ripe seeds drunk down with a glass of water, that would do the trick. The other really great medicinal use for this plant is to use the leaves for any kind of skin irritations like cuts, scrapes, bug bites, bee stings, uh, splinters, thorns, anything like that uh, that'll be useful for all those uh, problems. So, you, um, so one way to deal with it is just take the leaf and slap it on there, slap it on the, uh, the bleeding. Another way is you can take a leaf, put it in your mouth and chew it briefly and mix it with your saliva, which also has therapeutic properties and then apply that to your skin. And then if you have a larger area you need to cover, you can gather up a bunch of leaves, boil them briefly to soften them up, and then you can make a poultice over the affected area. So I heard a, a story that two guys were walking along a trail one day, and one of the brothers cut himself, and the other brother took a plantain leaf and put it on the cut, and the cut got better, and the brothers got the idea for Band-Aids from that, and the brothers' names were Johnson and Johnson. So I don't know if that's true, but it makes a good story. All right, on to the next plant. Okay, so walking in the woods or skiing in the woods in a couple days, you may still see these birds. And these are the birds that, yes, get caught in your socks in the fall, your dog's fur. And the guy who invented Velcro did get the idea from these birds. So this is a wonderfully edible plant called burdock, appropriately enough. The birds aren't edible, most of the rest of the plant is. So let's talk about that. So. Burdock is a biennial, it has a two year life cycle. So this is what it looks like at the beginning of the second year. It pretty much looks like this at the end of the first year too. So at that stage, there is a big beige taproot that goes into the ground uh, underneath these big uh, leaves. And by the way, you might say, boy, those leaves look like rhubarb. And there's two ways to tell them apart. And one way is the leaves are finely woolly on the underside and rhubarb leaves are smooth. And I'll show you the other way to tell apart on the next slide. So anyway, there is a big edible root uh, attached to these leaves. Unfortunately, you can't just grab these leaves and yank on the plant and get the root out that way. It will break on you. So you have to dig out the burdock roots. It's a lot of work and I don't usually bother. And I pretty much guarantee that your patience will give out before the root does because they're very, very long. And so you'd be digging and digging at and some point you say, ah, the heck with it. You might emerge with like a foot long piece of root maybe uh, three quarters of an inch in diameter. And so what do you do with it then? One simple way to prepare it is just to wash it off. You don't have to peel it. Slice it into half inch thick rounds and boil it in salted water till it's tender, about 15 minutes. It will taste like a starchy artichoke. But I am too lazy to do that. Instead, I wait for a stage of the second year's growth when it's beginning to produce the cylindrical flower stalk that eventually will have the flowers and form the burrs coming off this cylindrical central flower stalk. So around the first or second week in June in the Berkshires is when the plants are at this stage. Oh, by the way, this is the other way to tell this plant apart from uh, rhubarb is you'll see that these petioles, the leaf blades here, they're green or green streaked with a little purple and they have ridges on them like a celery stalk. And if this is a rhubarb, this would be smooth and reddish. Another way to tell them apart. Okay, so back to this central stalk here. So you just chop that off at ground level and lop off the top cluster, and then you have your stock. So, you know, all of these burdock flower stalks I gathered in less than half an hour. This is a really, really common weed on the edge of farm fields. So uh, I'm guessing that uh, the farmers would be more than happy to have you gather uh, the burdock uh, on the edge of their farms. And so now you do have to peel the outer layer of the burdock step. So you want to get that part off. But unlike the knotweed, the burdock stalks are solid all the way through. So even after you peel the stalks, you get all of this wonderful material inside the peeled stems uh, that's edible. And um, so this is a plant you can really fill up on because you can gather pounds and pounds of this stuff. Uh, and uh, all right. <coughs> so once you peel and chop up these uh, peeled stalks, what do you do? You just boil these in salted water until they're tender, which takes about five minutes. 
and then it's a fine vegetable just as is, or it's really good thrown in a spaghetti sauce, or another way it's really good is in a recipe where ordinarily you would use artichoke hearts and you mix it with mayonnaise and breadcrumbs and Parmesan cheese and you mix it all together, you bake it in the oven, it's a spread that you put on crackers. Well, you can substitute the boiled burdock flour stock rounds with the artichoke hearts in that recipe, it works great. So there it is, the baked burdock bloom stack bake and, uh, and it's uh, and that recipe is on my webpage. All right. Okay, so black locust. This is a native species, but it's native to Virginia. It's actually considered to be invasive in Massachusetts. And so another guilt-free foraging opportunity. And you're looking at the bumblebee in the center of the floor and say, "Oh, I don't want to hurt the bumblebees." Don't worry. These trees can be huge. They can be 40 or 50 feet tall and they're covered from top to bottom with flowers. So when the plants are blooming, let the pollinators fly into the upper branches and visit those flowers. And you can harvest the flowers from the lower branches. And there's tons of flowers. There's plenty to go around for everybody to have all they want. And so these flowers smell like jasmine and they taste like sweet pea pods. So they're great for eating raw, just stuffing your face right into your mouth or pulling off the central stalks. And then uh, you could eat, you know, add these to salads, you know, eat them just plain. Or a really good way to use them is to make fritters with them. And uh, and here, this recipe is in my book. So this is the black locust flower fritters. So let's hope by uh, uh, around Memorial Day. So let me just say it would be around Memorial Day weekend when you're going to see these uh, plants blooming in the Berkshires. So of course. A little bit earlier in South County, a little bit later in North County, a little bit earlier in lower elevations, a little bit later in higher elevations uh, is the timing for the black locust. So, uh, which means if you mess up and the flowers have already gone past their prime, where you are, the way to get around that is you can go higher elevation or further north and catch up to the plants where they're not quite as far advanced in the growing season and gather them there. So yeah, so uh, let's hope by next May when these uh, blossoms are, are uh, available that things are more relaxed enough with the pandemic that we can have folks over for a brunch because these black locust fritters are really excellent brunch material. Okay, but let's say that it's not time yet. We have to wait a little bit longer. And, you're, and you say, oh, I've got some friends that are gonna visit me over the summer or the fall. I really love to feed them these black locust fritters. How do I do that? Well, this is what you do. So in May, when the flowers are available, harvest the flowers, strip them off their central stalks and freeze them. And then later on, when you're ready to serve these, pull out the, the flowers from the uh, freezer and make the fritters from the frozen flowers. And those fritters will taste at least as good as they did from the flesh, fresh flowers. All right, so here are two very similar looking plants. The peppergrass on the left side and the poor man's pepper on the right side. They both go in Berkshire County. They're really hard to tell apart. You do not need to know how to tell them apart because they have the same flavor. They're both related members of the mustard family. And the one on the left is particularly good to know because this one has a really long season availability. It can stretch for like five months from May through November. I guess that's seven months. So anyway, it's these flat, round seed pods that are the fun part to eat on these plants. And if you just nibble on a few after a few seconds, you will discover why it's called peppergrass. It has a sharp flavor like watercress, which is actually a cousin of this plant. And so this is a great plant to remember if let's say uh, we can have company over and you have invited company over for supper and they arrive and the roast, whatever you're making for them isn't done yet and they're starving, you need to feed them something. So what you can go out to do, do is go out in your yard, find some peppergrass plants, pull these seed pods off, mix them with a little cream cheese, spread it on crackers, feed that to them and they'll love it and forget all about the fact that dinner isn't ready yet. All right, so, uh, and I had the example of just applying my knowledge to somebody else's program. So years ago, I was on another naturalist program and for lunch, she was assembling these roast beef and boursin sandwiches, and there was pepper grass growing right outside the building where the sandwiches were being made. And so I asked her, could we add some of these seed pods to the sandwiches? And she said, sure, and they were delicious. All right, so here is uh, wild mustard. And although wild mustard likes to grow near the shoreline where this photo is taken, this is also a really common farm weed. This is the plant that 
uh, you'll first start to see it in the spring, but you often see it through the summer into the fall. It has the yellow four petaled flowers in the shape of a cross. Yes, it is a member of the mustard family and you can eat mustard leaves, uh, you know, like mustard greens, you've all heard of those. And the flowers are edible. You can eat them raw or the, um, you can cook them and have them be uh, a wild broccoli. And even the seed pods on these plants, you can gather the seeds inside the seed pods and use them just like uh, mustard seed that you'd get at the co-op and grind them up and make your own uh, mustard sauce. All right, so Elizabeth, how are we doing time-wise? We're doing great. Um, a couple more minutes. All right, so I have, uh, so that's my spring edibles. If we go for about five minutes, I can cover like about six more summer edibles. Shall I go for it? What do you think, gang? I think he's pretty great. Go for it, Russ. All right, I'm getting nods, so I'm going to keep on going. All right, so purslane, this is a summer weed. This one you won't see until the hot weather really arrives. Really common uh, weed in organic farms. If you have vegetable garden home, you probably have this plant. And you've probably been weeding it and cursing it. This plant is probably more nutritious to eat than a lot of the vegetables that you're growing. It's high in iron. It's high in uh, omega-3 fatty acids. So you can eat it raw. You can eat it cooked. Um, these stems you can pickle. And, um, and I'm sure there's all kinds of fancy things you can do with it. But I'm going to show you a really easy way to use purslane that, once again, requires no cooking skill whatsoever if you didn't want to cook. And that is to add the purslane leaves in a gazpacho. And you don't even have to make a gazpacho. You could go to the farm stand or the food co-op and just buy the, you know, the uh, uh, gazpacho and then just throw the purslane leaves in there. And the, the texture of the purslane leaves works really well in the gazpacho. Of course, uh, you're most welcome to make your own homemade gazpacho with your own uh, homegrown uh, vegetables. And it would be great that way too. All right, so daylilies are edible. And this would be a good time to talk about foraging etiquette that for uh, uh, a plant that people grow to look at, uh, you just need to uh, be aware of that. So I wouldn't forage for daylilies, you know, growing next to your neighbor's mailbox, for example, unless they said, go right ahead. Uh, but I have seen daylilies growing wild in Berkshire County, uh, not in somebody's yard, but just a popular. In fact, one of the places you might encounter daylilies is kind of a, a cool little forensic thing you can do. You might be way off in the woods somewhere and be hiking uh, along a trail. And all of a sudden, you see a patch of daylilies. You say, how the hell are there daylilies in the middle of the woods? And I pretty much guarantee that if you look around in that spot, you will see the foundation of a house, probably a farmhouse from the 1800s that long ago fell down and the, and the farm has reverted back to woodlands, but the daylilies is still there showing you that that farmer was growing daylilies in their yard because these plants have been used that way for hundreds of years in New England. But it's actually the, the this plant is native to where, where it comes from is China. In fact, two very common Chinese dishes, mushu and hot and sour soup, use dried daylily flowers. So if you've eaten those two dishes, you've probably eaten daylilies. But there is a cautionary note about eating daylilies that I will tell you at the end of what I described what to eat. Okay, so daylilies, you can eat the shoots in the spring when they first come up, and this is an early to emerge plant. You can eat the tender hearts of the taller plants, like the inside part, like a scallion. The flower buds are edible. The open flowers are edible. The wilted flowers are edible. Flower buds, you can just saute in a skillet and some butter for a few minutes, and it tastes like oniony green beans. So, so that's great, all these different edible parts. All right, so what's the cautionary note? Well, apparently for a relatively small subset of humanity, and I'm guessing that it's fewer than one in five people, there is a chemical in daylilies that uh, apparently uh, does not agree with some people's digestive systems. And they can, get a, uh, uh, they can feel nauseous and or uh, have a loose bowel movement after eating daylilies. And so if you're one of those people, you'd find out right away, uh, you wouldn't have flashbacks later on or anything. You just know that daylilies don't agree with you. And, uh, and the one edible part I think I forgot to mention is the tubers. So that's an edible part that's available right now, although it's not something you're going to be able to get when the ground is frozen. But if we do have a thaw and you know of a patch of daylilies, you could actually dig up some tubers and eat them in the middle of the winter time. Those tubers would still be there. So it's the raw tubers that I think uh, is the most likely to flare up this uh, digestive problem I just mentioned. Uh, so be aware of that. But um, uh, 
Anyway, uh, so that is the day lily. Oh, let me mention one other thing. So um, the only day lily I can vouch that's safe to eat is the tall orange flower day lilies. There are some really fancy kinds out there now. In fact, I think that the horticulturalists in their zeal to come out with new flower cultures, uh, 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 colors, and, and varieties are doing some uh, things where they're actually pushing the species boundary with daylilies and mixing them with other species, which might not be edible. And so I can't vouch for any, you know, newfangled daylily varieties that might be showing up uh, uh, at the garden centers right now. Just look for the old fashioned tall orange daylilies. Those are the ones that are safely edible with this one caveat that I just mentioned. All right, so chicory, uh, chicory is edible in the spring and the fall. The leaves are edible. They look just like dandelion leaves and you can eat them like dandelion leaves. Uh, chicory flowers, which come out in the summer are edible. They don't have a lot of flavor. So why use them? Because blue is an unusual food color. So it's fun to just snip the petals off and to add them to a salad just to get that nice color in there. <coughs> Probably the most well-known edible part on a chicory is, as I drink a beverage here, it's a beverage that you make from the roots. And this is all described in my book. But basically what you do is you harvest the roots. And this is a good time of year to harvest the roots now because the energy has gone back into the plants for the dormant season. So anytime between now and let's say May, if you can find some chicory plants and they'll look like dandelion plants with dandelion leaves, but this stalk will be brown and about a foot and a half or two feet tall. So look for that. And then uh, you just uh, spread the roots out in a cookie sheet and roast them till they... Uh, 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 get brittle and aromatic and then grind them up in a food processor and then use the grounds to make a beverage. And I find I often, uh, I only need about half the amount of chicory grounds to make the same strength beverage as coffee grounds. And whatever device you use, your plunger, your Mr. Coffee Maker, whatever to make your coffee, you can use the same device to make the chicory drink. And it is amazing how much the chicory drink uh, tastes like coffee, especially if you usually drink your coffee with cream and sugar and you drink the chicory the same way. The flavor is really similar. The one big difference is chicory does not have caffeine in it. So you're one of these people who says, well, what's the point of drinking it if there's no caffeine? Then the chicory is just not going to cut it for you. All right, so here is the common mallow, common weed and organic farms. There's a long season availability. And from the summer onward, uh, the leaves are edible. But the fun part to eat on these plants are the immature seed pods, which are called cheeses because they really look like miniature half inch in diameter cheese wheels. And back in the days when kids used to play with plants, this is the plant that they would seek out and play with. And these can be used raw in salads or just like okra, which is a relative to thicken soups and stews and stuff like that. So that is the common mallow. All right, so here is a invasive species, the common barberry. It's different from the Japanese barberry, which bears its flowers and fruits on the underside of the stem, just singly or maybe in pairs. Here you see big clusters of flowers coming down and that relies, um, results in big clusters of berries coming down. So this is the yummy one. The Japanese barberry, it's not poisonous, it's just not yummy. This is the yummy one. These fruits, and you may still be able to find them now because they will persist over the winter. They are very tart like cranberries, but they make what I consider to be among the best jellies there is. And yes, you can still gather them now. They will um, uh, start to wrinkle up a little bit and look like little red raisins, but you can still use them to make jelly. They'll still have a nice sour flavor. All right, so here is autumn olive, another invasive species. So in May, it looks like this, and the flowers have a nice smell like sweet pepper bush, which is completely unrelated. And here's a close-up of what the fruit looks like. So it uh, is red with these silvery white speckles on the outside. And you can see how it grows, grows in great gobs in the branches. So this fruit is ripe when just the gentlest of tickling motions causes this fruit to fall into your basket. If you have to kind of hack at it with your hands and yank on it, it's not ripe yet. Wait till it comes off with just a tickle. So you can fill up your baskets quite quickly. And then um, uh, what I tip it, you can eat autumn olives raw. The flavor will vary from bush to bush. Really good autumn olive tastes like a green Thompson seed this grape. And these fruits have seeds in them, which you can swallow or spit out. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but I typically make puree from all the autumns, autumn, all, all the autumn olives I gather. Yeah, so that's, you know, this was not a very good year when I can only fit these many autumn olives in a basket. A good year, I could easily fill up this entire basket. 
All right, so you bring them home and I'll get out a, a bowl, fill this up with water, dump the autumn olives in there, just pick out any spoiled fruits, any leaves or seeds, that got, any leaves or twigs that got in there. And then uh, after I wash them, I put them into the cooking pot and I just simmer them in, in just about a quarter inch of water, that's it. And you simmer them until the fruit softens and then I put everything through a food mill here, which is just to separate the juice and the pulp from the seed. And if you don't have a food mill, you can just use a strainer for this part. And then, yes, yeah, see here are all the seeds that are left back. So these uh, uh, I put into my compost pile and they do not grow new autumn olive plants, I'm happy to say. So there's the puree and I pour this into trays and a, well, actually before I get to what I typically do, this puree is the raw material to make autumn olive sorbet, autumn olive chiffon pie, autumn olive cheesecake, things like that. But here's what I typically do is I pour the puree into trays in my food dehydrator and I let it run overnight. So there we go. I let it run overnight. And then uh, the next day I get these sheets of fruit leather that I chop up into these little pieces uh, so they're easy to eat. And were this to be a live program, I definitely would have fed you some autumn olive fruit leather. So I'm really sorry. That is the major drawback for these virtual programs is I can't feed you tastes and sips of all these yummy edibles that uh, I described in this talk. So, so this fruit leather, um, it, uh, has, it tastes good. It has vitamin C in it. And the USDA did a study in the autumn olive fruit pulp a few years back, and they discovered that it's up to 18 times higher in lycopene content than tomatoes. So it's really good for you. And yes, you can make wine from autumn olives too. So with that, here is my last slide. So thank you so much for uh, bearing with me with this show. And yeah, so here's where to find me on the internet where I have, um, uh, I haven't uh, uh, worked out all my classes I'll be teaching next year. And I think I will be able to do some in-person walks eventually once uh, uh, things are under control, we can get together and be outside again. You know, maybe we'll have to still wear masks and stuff, but we'll figure out how to make it happen. And I will have some more online programs like this and maybe some in-person slideshows. And so here's my email address if you want to uh, uh, write me with any questions you have. And yeah, this book that I keep mentioning. So here it is. This book was published by a land trust. This is the Essex County Greenbelt Association. So Essex County, Mass is in the northeast corner of Mass. So it's the furthest away from Berkshire County. And there are a couple coastal species in this book, like beach plums and uh, um, beach peas that aren't available in Berkshire County, but just about everything else is available, like the black locust I talked to you and uh, the autumn olive that I talked to you about and the Japanese knotweed that I talked to you about are in this book with recipes and everything. So the books cost 15 bucks, uh, but uh, when I give my slideshows and I'm doing in-person programs and I can just, you know, pull out a box of box and just sell people books at the end of the program. I don't keep any of that money. I give it all to Greenbelt in gratitude for the fact that they allow foraging as a permitted activity in all their properties that are open to the public, which is uh, dozens of properties covering thousands of acres. And I'm so grateful for that. I said, just keep all the money the book makes and just buy more land with it. So that is the story of my book. So with that, I am happy to take any questions. If there aren't any questions, I'm gonna have to tell another story. Well, I don't have a question, Russ, but um, I used to do gardening for a very old rabbi friend and um, and he would constantly tell me he's an old organic gardener. He was constantly telling me that purslane was Gandhi's favorite food. Oh, yeah, it does grow in India. That's right. Yeah, that's great to know. So um, do I need to be looking at the chat to see if there are any questions there? I don't think so. Oh, um, I don't see. Oh, who's that? Any chance you would feel good that's easy to carry for ID purposes? Oh, yes. So my book isn't really an ID guide. And, uh, and uh, I'm afraid I'm not um, really the best person to ask that question because I discovered, so I've been doing this since high school. That's when I started teaching is when I was in high school because I would get books like Ewell Gibbons's books out of the library. And those books have line drawings. So they're not even photographs. They're very rudimentary drawings. And, and I discovered that I could walk a trail and the edible plants would start waving to me, figuratively speaking, of course, from the side of the trail saying, hey, hey, you know me, you know me. And I would discover that it was a plant I read about in the book. And I realized that is a very usual, unusual skill to have. So, 
which is why I like to do the in-person programs to connect people to the plants directly so they can see where the plants like to grow, what plants like to grow in association with them, if it's a plant that's edible raw, actually uh, taste the plant in situ and stuff like that. So um, the amongst the foraging community, the biggest buzz, the most positive things are being said about Sam Thayer's books, which are very thorough. He's got at least three of them out. He's from northern Wisconsin, and so there isn't 100 percent overlap between what uh, he talks about in his books and what we have in Berkshire County. But uh, and and he doesn't have recipes in his book. But in terms of a field guide with really good photos and very good narrative descriptions of what the plants look like, I would recommend that's a good place to go. How do you spell his last name? Oh, T H A Y E R. Sam Thayer. Ah, that's good. I I searched Sayers, and apparently he's a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Well, that's not good to know. All right. So, uh, all right. So I'm going to just uh, save the chat here. All right. And, uh, um, well, and Vivian, Vivian Olowski. Oh, sorry. You're, you're looking at the chat. What's that? You're looking no, at the I'm chat. Done. Oh, um, Vivian Orlowski is wondering, um, she says, thanks for the excellent presentation. Which non-native plants in our region are important to nourish bees and other nat native pollinators? Oh, um, well, um, as you know, because uh, it sounds like the person who asked that question is somewhat informed, uh, our cherished honeybees are not a native species. They're from Eurasia. And in fact, some uh, native bee uh, experts and in, uh, in, um, aficionados are concerned that our honeybees might be uh, actually uh, outcompeting our native bees for some of their forage sources. So. Uh, but we all like honey, so it's kind of a trade-off. Uh, anyway, um, you know, mostly our native pollinators are looking for native plants to uh, get their nectar. But, uh, but to tell the truth, a lot of these flowering plants are visited by native pollinators as well as non-native pollinators. So, you know, something like a dandelion, for example, there's lots of pollinators that visit dandelions in the spring. It's you know, very easy to access the pollen in a flower like that with a nice flat top. Same thing with a, a plant I didn't talk about today, but I could have because it's edible is Queen Anne's Lace or the wild carrot. I understand from folks that study flowers that pollinators like that the wild carrot is one of our non-native species that scores high enough with folks that are paying attention to what our native pollinators are visiting that they're actually encouraging people to leave the wild carrot in the fields. You do not have to eradicate because that is a non-native plant that is apparently a good uh, uh, pollinator plant for our native bees. Hmm. Um, very interesting. Um, Jeff Turner is wondering if multiflora rose hips are edible? Yes, they are. So I don't have a slide in my show to talk to you about that. So you'll just have to for those of you that know the species, just in your mind, imagine a multiflora rose, all right? Uh, but let me give you some piece of generic information that's gonna help everybody first. All roses are edible, whatever species it is. So whether it's, a, and whether it's cultivated or wild, and the two edible parts are the rose petals and the rose hips. And a rose hip is just a fruit of, fruit of any rose, wild or domesticated. So uh, the best, um, rose hip for foraging, or a rose period for foraging, is the uh, the rosa rugosa, which is the one that you see when you go to the beach and you see them growing near the beach. So that's actually not a native species. It's from Japan. It's naturalized along the coastline here. And I guess I guess those might show up in a garden here and there in Berkshire County, but you're really not going to see them in the wild in Berkshire County. It is unfortunately the multiflora rose is the one you're most likely to encounter in Berkshire County, and it is the least desirable rose from both a, a culinary and an a ecological standpoint. So it is an invasive species. Uh, so, all right, but here is what I can say about eating those little rose hips, which I, I if you know the plant, you know those rose hips are really teeny. They're barely bigger than BBs. And I used to think, what a complete waste of time these things are. And then I discovered three interesting things about them. The first thing is they ripen relatively late. So like November, they're out. In fact, you might still be able to find some in the landscape now. And there's hardly any other fruit out there now that humans can eat. So that's a fun thing. The second thing is that although each individual fruit is small, they grow in clusters. And so 
just one little movement like going like that, you can gather like a couple dozen of these uh, little rose hips. And the third thing is that if you just pop those in your mouth, those little rose hips, just a big uh, you know handful right at your mouth and roll it around in your mouth, the flavor is very nice. It's very sweet. I think it's just about as good as the rose rugosa. So, but here's the thing you want to be a responsible forager. What you need to do is to be like a dog walker, bring a baggie with you. So when you're done uh, eating the pulp off those seeds, spit the seeds into a baggie and then throw the baggie out in the trash. Do not spit the seeds on the ground because then you'd be helping to proliferate this invasive species. <laughs> Um, very good. Are they really high in vitamin C like other rose hips? Do you know? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there are any other. All right. So oh. let me tell, uh, let me tell one more story. Yeah. And so while I'm telling this story, this is going to give anybody that has additional questions time to think of your questions and type them in the chat. But in the meantime, let me tell this one more story. Let me just wake up my screen here. Okay. So uh, when I do talks away from home, uh, like in the Berkshires, for example, I live in Eastern Mass, Western Mass, it's far enough away that if I'm giving like a nighttime talk, you know, I've got lots of friends in the Berkshires, people say, oh, stay at our house, stay at our house. So uh, I have places I can crash and stay over. I'm giving an evening program. But uh, this one time I was giving a talk in Wolfboro, New Hampshire, up near Lake Winnipesaukee, you know, a good sized town up near Lake Winnipesaukee. So uh, I didn't know anybody in this town. So I stayed in a cheap motel room, and this motel had cable TV, which I do not have at home. So I've hardly ever in my entire life seen a cable TV program. But I saw one that night because I'm surfing through the channels, and the show comes on called Man vs. Wild, which I'd never seen before or since. And this particular episode, the guy was out in the Everglades in one of these hummocks in the middle of the swamp trying to start a fire, and all his kindling was totally wet, and he was struggling for about 10 minutes, and I thought, this is stupid, and so I shut off the show. So then the next morning, I go out to the trailhead where I'm meeting everybody. There's like 25 people there, and it turned out they had all seen the show. So they start peppering me with questions. Could you survive on this? Could you survive on that? This one guy says, is an acorn a complete, he asked me, is an acorn a complete protein? And I said, what kind of a strange question is that? <laughs> Who would tell you that you could only eat acorns? I since found out an acorn is a complete protein, but I didn't know it at the time. So after a while, I got a little annoyed with all these questions and said, all right, all right, you people. Granted, we are in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. It is a little boonie around here. But even around here, you'd be able to hike out to the nearest 7-Eleven way before you'd find yourself in a starvation, starvation situation. So just relax, all right, relax, OK? So then we start the walk. And the walk was on one of these multi-use pathways. You'll know they have these in the Berkshires, too, where in the summer they're used by the runners and the and the uh, the hikers and the mountain bikers and stuff like that. And in the winter, they're used by the cross-country skiers and the snowmobilers. And the snowmobilers like to make these little hand-lettered signs, so many miles to this town and so many miles to that town and so on. All right, so we start the walk. And 10 minutes after I make that joke, we look up on the side of the trail and nailed to a tree is this sign. <laughs> so my point was proved. Yes, there are 7-Elevens you can get to, even uh, if you're running out of food. So, but in uh, uh, just to deal with the question seriously, though, about uh, you know the question that was asked, because I do occasionally run into people with this macho approach to the outdoors, like I'm going to go out in the woods with just a cooking pot and a box of matches, and I'm going to live off the land. Well, all right, but um, and, and, or you know, somebody will say after I give a program like this, Russ, I bet you could survive indefinitely with what you know in the woods. I suppose I could, but it has never occurred to me to try that because, well, first of all, I really enjoy this stuff. I hope the slideshow was evidence of that. I do not need to have the extra adrenaline rush of, oh my God, I'm going to starve unless I find enough to eat to make it interesting. It's already really interesting. And the other problem is if you take what I call a macho approach to the outdoors is uh, a couple bad things can happen. One thing is hunger is a really powerful motivating factor and you might be tempted to pick more of a sensitive native species than you should uh, because you look at a patch and you say, well, you know, I'm, I know that species is rare, but damn it, I'm hungry. And so you, you know, pick more than you should. Then the other problem that can happen is if you really start to get hungry and you're not getting enough uh, calories, enough blood flow to your brain, uh, your thinking can start to be cloudy and you can start to forget 
How do I prepare these plants safely to make them safe to eat? How do I distinguish the edible plants from the poisonous lookalikes? And you can start making mistakes. So the advice I give to folks is if you're gonna spend a considerable amount of time, you know, days on end out in the woods, take plenty of food with you. And then you can relax and you can forage for the sheer joy of it if you feel like it. So if you wake up one morning and it's really crappy and stormy outside, you don't have to go foraging because you've got plenty of food with you. You can just relax. So that's my advice for you. Mm. All right, any more questions? Yeah, Vivian is also wondering if any restaurants in Massachusetts have included non-native edible plants on their menu. Uh, yes, uh, occasionally. And uh, and I guess I'm okay with that. Like, you know, uh, in my book, I talk, tell a story that there was a restaurant up in Montpelier, Vermont area that used to put knotweed on their menu and they called it red, red asparagus. And, and that's fine, you know. Uh, uh, I understand the cachet of wild foods and some restaurants are seeking to, to do that. I just, I get a little nervous though, because I'm afraid that uh, some uh, folks that are chefs and other people that are in the food business are a little tone deaf when it comes to being sensitive to the ecological subtleties that I'm trying to make a point to you folks in this audience that I think can understand where you know, they're so driven by flavor that it's like, you know, if they taste a native species, it's really yummy. It's like, oh boy, I can't wait to put this on the menu. And one restaurant doing it, um, you know, is a relatively small impact. But what can happen in the restaurant world is thing can, things can go viral. You know, if somebody's, you know, plating up, you know, some native species and it's selling really well. And then the restaurant across the street says, oh, we should have that on my menu. The, cult, the cumulative impact of all that gathering of the native species, I'm afraid, could add up to some really serious adverse impacts. Uh, uh, so that's why I get a little nervous when I see uh, wild plants of any kind become articles of commerce. So, uh, so even even non-native. Well, it's just because non-native, I'm not worried about, but I'm worried about. Uh, folks not stopping there and yeah. just not discerning the difference between the non-native and the native and just not understanding why it can be a problem. And just yeah. in their eagerness to, you know, please their diners, just wanting to, you know, put something on the menu that really shouldn't be there. And f last question, uh, Jonah Millet is wondering about hardy kiwi. Yeah, so hardy kiwi, I could have included that in my show because it does grow wild in the Berkshires. Um, and it is a really yummy fruit. So those of you that don't know it, it's a diminutive little thing. It's about one quarter the size of a normal kiwi fruit, and it's green on the outside, and it's not furry at all. So you can take the entire fruit and pop it in your mouth, and I think it's even tastier than a regular kiwi fruit. Uh, it is an invasive species in the Berkshires, and the main problem with the hardy kiwi is the the plant grows extremely vigorously and the vines are very heavy and they can grow to the tippy top of a mature forest canopy tree and yank the whole tree down. In fact, there's some really eerie places, almost like a scene from a horror movie. You're walking in the woods in the Berkshires and then you come upon this scene where there's only one plant growing, no trees, no other plants. The only thing you see in the middle of this clearing is hardy kiwi. And then you see it clambering up all the trees all around it uh, and, you know, a year or two, they'll be pulled down into the gaping maw of this expanding, uh, you know, uh, uh, metastasizing hardy kiwi in the landscape. So, um, so yes, if you encounter it in the wild uh, and you see fruits, yes, they are yummy. I've certainly eaten it, um, but it, it's a plant that um, is, is, it's, it's, it does not uh, behave in the Berkshire's landscape, unfortunately. Well, Russ, I want to thank you so, so, so very much um, for uh, for joining us here tonight. I want to thank all of our attendees. I want to invite everyone to join us next month um, in the new year on January 19th at 6 p.m., same place. Um, keep your eye on your email for a registration link. Um, I just want to thank, th this is our, our last beat event before um, the Christmas holidays, and we're currently in Hanukkah, and I just I want to thank everyone um, for coming out to beat and supporting us through this very very difficult year, um, and for all everyone showing up in whatever way they can um, in such such meaningful ways. So thank you all. We're so grateful to you. Thank you, Russ, for your wonderful yeah, presentation. Thank, thank you, everybody. Russ. Happy foraging.
Yeah. Happy, Happy holidays. Happy holidays.